We have developed this short video to help you understand what is required from you when applying for a new job and how to stand out from other applicants. Make sure that you have a pen and paper handy to take notes throughout. And remember, you can pause the video at any time so there is no need to rush. The term employability is becoming increasingly important. Employability means being aware of your attitudes, developing behaviours appropriate for employers and having a mindset of continuous improvement. Employers are looking for people who are flexible, take the initiative and have the ability to undertake a variety of tasks in different environments. Employability skills are now more service oriented, making information and social skills increasingly important. As the labour market is intensely competitive and employers in private, public and the third sector are all seeking the best talent, it makes sense to explore how you can become your best. That does not mean that you have to be overly competitive, as that might put employers off, but being aware of your capabilities and developing both areas of strength and weakness. If you want extra help in preparing for the workplace and how to get more out of your career, then please take our extended employability course. There are quite a few sites online where you can peruse different templates. Some are free, but most are not. Before you even choose the layout and look, you need to plan ahead and prepare the information you need to fill in various sections. But here's a couple of helpful resource sites. MyPerfectCV.co.uk is a useful tool, as it is free, and contains useful examples of what to write in each section. Read.co.uk and monster.co.uk both have free CV templates to download and use. There is also some basic guidance on what to write as you progress. However, firstly, we'll take a look at the preparation required. If you've found a job which is advertised directly by the employer, go and have a look at their company website first. Once there, you'll get a good feel of how the company works and the type of culture they operate. This will help you to decide if the company feels right for you. Before you apply for any role, you need to gain an understanding of the type of person the prospective employer is looking for. Whether it's from a job advert, person specification or role profile posted on their careers site, use this information as a blueprint for your CV. The more effectively you show a clear match between the skills required and those that you possess, the more likely you are to secure an interview. Your CV should be a living document. To make the most of it, you'll probably need to adapt it to specific roles or blueprints. Employers do not have the time to read between the lines, so the more you do to promote your suitability, the greater your chance of success. Make it easy for them by doing the following. Mold your CV to their requirements. Highlight where your skills match their needs. Point out the value that you could bring to their organisation. As an example, if they want a great team worker, provide examples of where you have worked as part of a team. This could include a football, hockey or quiz team. It does not have to be work related. If you don't have the examples, just use positive examples and showcase what you did in a clear way. Give yourself the edge by using your CV to accentuate your real skills and abilities and to promote achievements and successes, but be honest and factual. Do remember to include all of your contact details on all of your pages, as you never know if your CV will get split up. Always include your name, address, telephone number and email address, and if you have a website that you think will add value to your application, include that too. As a minimum, put your email address and mobile number as a footer, so it isn't in the main body. Aim to keep to two or three pages and bullet point your content so that it is easy to digest. It is critical that each area of your CV is easy to read and allows the key points to stand out. Use a universal font such as Arial, Times New Roman, Palatino, Courier or Century Gothic rather than one that may not be available on the recipient's computer. Don't forget to proofread your CV and spell check once completed. Use an uncluttered layout with plenty of white space and wide margins. Choose a single, common typeface 
as already mentioned. Follow best practice. 11 to 12 point body text, 14 point maximum for headings, and embolden headings. No capitals, especially on internet CVs, where capitals are seen as shouting. Don't reduce the margins to fit more in, or else printing out may be problematic. If you need another page, use one but don't reduce the font to try to fit more words into the document. Print one side of the paper only and number the pages if there are two or more. Name, address and contact details are a must. You might want to add these details to the footer of your CV in case pages go missing. Employers are usually interested in your most recent jobs, so concentrate on your last two positions, although you might occasionally want to highlight earlier roles if they are relevant to the role you are applying for. If you haven't worked full-time before, or on a voluntary basis, you must include this. Start with your most recent position and work backwards. Provide a job title, start and finish dates, the name of the company and a brief description of what they do. Treat a promotion like a separate position and add content accordingly. List relevant responsibilities, achievements, duties and skills. Make sure that you explain any gaps in your career, as even if you're not working, you may have gained valuable transferable skills and experience from other pursuits. For example, a student taking six months out to travel will have gained life skills, plus a deeper cultural understanding social skills and possibly problem solving and decision making skills too. All of this will make you sound more rounded. Usually these come near the end, but if particular qualifications are essential for the job and make you more marketable, put them on the first page after your profile or key skills. Include relevant professional qualifications and academic ones and any courses which may not be accredited, but where you have learnt valuable skills or knowledge. List qualifications, giving the subject, awarding body and year. Mention relevant skills such as languages, technology, vocational or on the job training. Include relevant training or skills acquired while unemployed, or during a leave period, or doing part-time or voluntary work. You may want to include the names and contact details of your references on your CV, but there is no obligation. Whether you include them or not, it is wise to have your referees ready and willing to represent you. Include any endorsements and recommendations. For example, given a special award by ABC for contribution to ABC project or awarded a prize for full attendance at school for five years. Future proofing. Remember to keep your CV up to date, even when you are no longer looking for a job. You'll be thankful when the time comes and it will prevent you from forgetting important dates, details, projects or successes. If you follow these simple rules and put all of these tips into practice, you are more likely to impress on the strength of your CV. Remember to keep it factual and do not try to overly impress or overestimate your achievements. If you are filling in an application form, you will still need to work out the best way to present your skills and experience. This is why completing an application form often takes just as much time and effort as writing a CV and covering letter. Some jobs ask you to apply online. There will be specific requirements which have been decided prior to a job being advertised. Earlier on, there will be a job analysis conducted for the role. The job analyst, usually with HR or organisational design, uses the following process. Activities, behaviours, knowledge and motivations for a target job or roles are gathered from people working in the target job. The activities, behaviours, knowledge and motivations for the target job or role are analysed and grouped into a tentative list of competencies. Managers and supervisors familiar with the job or role rate each competency on how important it is to job success and then rank the competencies in order of importance. 
A statistical analysis is applied to the ratings and rankings and a final list of competencies is produced. Then, the person specification, job description or a combination of the two, a role profile, will be used to create an advert. Most adverts have detail about what the role entails and the key skills and experience required for the role. These are known as job requirements. Application forms will inquire about this criteria as well as important personal details. For example, a summary of your work history, educational qualifications, etc. There is also space for you to give evidence showing that you have the knowledge, skills, abilities and other personal qualities needed to do the job. These are referred to as competencies. In the space or spaces provided on the application form, you will need to explain in your own words how, when and where you have put these competencies into practice. That is, you must describe the actions that you took. It is not enough to have shown that you have relevant experience. You must show evidence that you have experience of putting into use those particular skills, knowledge, abilities and personal qualities that are needed for the post for which you are applying. Traditional application forms and CVs require you to list your experiences such as qualifications, training or jobs which you have had and sometimes to list your achievements. They don't ask you to describe how you achieved success. An application form that requires you to describe the way that you behaved in certain situations and the effect that this had will give the recruiter the opportunity to judge the extent to which you are capable of applying the same behaviours in a new role. Interviews are designed to draw out skills, experience and competences. Questions will be job related and will test the fulfilment of job requirements. In most cases, competency based interviews are used. In the case of the personal shopper, you would be asked questions relating to the role profile. Expect customer service, teamwork and initiative to be asked, as well as probing your experience to date. This will ensure that the interviewer is clear of the level of organisational and job fit you have with the role. If screening interviews are used, it may be that there are lots of suitable candidates. You should still be prepared to share in-depth examples of what you have achieved and how you have achieved these examples. You may be asked to complete a telephone interview before meeting the recruiter as this allows them to shortlist potential candidates and save time. Questions can be worded to check that candidates can fulfil the job requirements, for example, qualifications and lifting, among others, as well as checking, very importantly, that a candidate has a legal right to work in the UK. In this case, the onus is on the employer to carry out adequate checks and obtain original proof or face a fine or civil penalty currently £20,000 per worker. When candidates are asked to interview, recruiters need to be clear about the process, location, reporting details and what will be involved. Invitations to interview may be sent by email or by letter. Sometimes you may receive a phone invitation, so try to answer the phone professionally at all times. Only candidates who look like a close match will be invited to interview, so it is important that you relate your skills and experience to what the recruiter is looking for in your CV, application form and interview. Some employers use just one interview as a basis for their decision. Others ask candidates back for a second time. Interviews are also your opportunity to find out more about the job and the organisation. Employers want you to have enough information to make your decision to accept a job offer with confidence. Careful and thorough preparation is essential and will help you cope with any interview. Prepare well prior to the interview by working through the following steps. Step one, Find out how to get there and allow plenty of time for your journey. It can take time to find your way around a venue when you don't know where you are going. Step two, 
take time to review the company website and newsletters in order to consider potential questions about the post or the organisation. Step 3. Decide what to wear. Make sure it's appropriate and comfortable. Do check if you're unsure. Do groom yourself and ensure that you look clean and tidy. Personal appearances do count. If you are unkempt and turn up in jeans when the dress code is formal, you may not be seen as a good organisational fit. Step 4. If you have any particular needs for the interview, for example if you are visually impaired, hard of hearing, use a wheelchair, let them know. Interview panels should provide support and access for candidates where required. Step 5. Read over your CV and application form. Think about your personal skills, motivation and personality. Read the job description and think about how your skills and experience match with what the employer is looking for. Identify why you will be able to do the job with specific reference to the job description and person specification. Think about your successes, big or small. Also, use the lessons you have learned from where things haven't gone as well as you had hoped for. Step 6. Prepare to ask the interviewer questions about the job or the organisation. Be polite and shake hands when you meet the interviewer. Remember to take your time to answer questions. The interviewer will not expect you to rush your answers. If you can't think of a work-based example, but have an example from college or university, or from a social context, ask if you can use that instead. Be honest. If something did not go as well as expected, explain how you used that learning in a further example. The interviewer should build rapport with you. Sit forwards and look interested throughout the interview. The interviewer will notice this. Effective communication. Communication skills are important to everyone. They are how we give and receive information and convey our ideas and opinions with those around us in a positive way. Communication comes in many forms. For example, verbal, which includes sounds, language and tone of voice. Audible includes listening and hearing. Non-verbal communication includes facial expressions, body language and posture. Written communication includes journals, emails, blogs and text messages. Visual communication includes signs, symbols and pictures. It is important to develop a variety of skills for both communicating to others and learning how to interpret the information received from others. Knowing our audience and understanding how they need to receive information is equally important as knowing ourselves. The average person spends 45% of their time listening, but sadly 75% of oral communication is lost and the remaining 25% is forgotten within weeks. Listening is an active process. The mnemonic LISTEN can be applied to learn better listening skills. L. Look interested and give encouraging signs. I. Inquire and ask questions and take notes. S. Stay on the subject. T. Test your understanding. Paraphrase and summarise. E. Evaluate the message. What is being said and how will it come across? N. Neutralise your feelings. Keep an open mind. Do not forget to look interested by sitting forward. Do not doodle or do anything other than listen and take part in the communication. The process of face-to-face -face communication can be summarised using the mnemonic WASP. W stands for welcome. Remember to greet the person. A stands for ask. Ask what you need to know. S stands for say. Say what you need to say. P stands for part. Part on good terms with clear actions and next steps for both parties. Having self-awareness allows you to see where your thoughts and emotions are taking you. It also allows you to take control of your emotions, behaviour and personality so you can make changes you want. Until you are aware, in the moment of your thoughts, emotions, words and behaviour, you will have difficulty making changes in the direction of your life. 
Self-awareness is developed through practices in focusing your attention on the details of your personality and behaviour. Emotional intelligence is actually probably more important than general IQ. Employers like to recruit people who will join in activities, can work both individually and in a team, show a capacity for personal leadership and initiative, and demonstrate a willingness to experience new situations and cultures. Whilst basic literacy, numeracy, technical skills, craft skills remain vital, today's economy and society increasingly demands people with an ability to cope with change and adapt quickly to new environments and people. Emotional intelligence is noticing patterns of thought and small triggers that build up towards positive and negative emotions. In this heightened awareness, you can make better choices in your thought process, long before an emotional reaction or destructive behaviour. This is applying self-awareness and it increases behavioural competence. Self-esteem goes a long way to personal success and success in a job. However, comparing yourself to others can be extremely detrimental to building healthy self-esteem. In our society, it is quite easy to compare ourselves to others, but it is something we must learn to move away from. We start to feel that we are just not good enough. Instead of comparing yourself to others, it is important to remind yourself of all the positive qualities you possess. When you recognise that you are a unique person who has a lot to offer to the world, you will feel your sense of self-esteem rising. Comparing yourself to others is often linked to negative self-talk, which is another thing you must be mindful of. Let's look at how this works. I'm hopeless at finding a job. I will find the right job for me. Becoming aware of our body language is an important realisation we must make if we want to develop healthy self-esteem. It is important to walk and sit with your posture upright, with your shoulders rolled back. You should also try not to cross your arms when speaking to others, because this can make you appear guarded. With positive body language, not only will you appear more confident, but you will also feel more confident. Eye contact, eye contact is something else that will help you to develop healthy self-esteem. Low self-esteem is often connected with looking away from others when speaking. Don't worry if you struggle with this now, it is something you can learn to do over time. To begin with, you can start to maintain eye contact with close friends and colleagues who you are comfortable with. Over time, it will become a natural habit. Maintaining eye contact will make you appear more confident to others, which should help you to feel more confident about yourself as well. Building confidence is the key to success, peace of mind and well-being. Having self-confidence boosts your self-esteem and helps you achieve your goals. Self-confidence is all about having faith in your own abilities. By trusting these abilities, you'll be able to deal with anything. It is not something you are necessarily born with, but it is a way of approaching things that can be learned. Very few people can claim to be totally self-confident and most would like to be confident in certain areas of their lives. You are likely to feel confident when you know what you are talking about, when you do something you've done well, and when you are with people that you trust. So thinking about a new job may just add to anxiety, but employers will realise that and will help you. It is in their interests to see you succeed. Whenever you are faced with a new challenge, or are asked to do something you don't like, you may feel a lack of confidence. You may worry that it won't go well, that your performance will be disappointing, and you will come out of it with a poor image. There are a number of ways that you can build up your confidence to deal with these types of situation. The first step is to decide what your lack of confidence is about. It could be due to a lack of information, 
a lack of preparedness, or a need to discuss your ideas with someone else who has more knowledge than you. Thankfully, all of these are easily dealt with. You can research to find out more information, you can be prepared, and you should be able to find someone who will go through your ideas with you. Sometimes it is not easy to define where your lack of confidence comes from. All you know is that the thought of doing something or making a change fills you with dread, making you shrink back into your comfort zone. However, there are ways of dealing with this. As mentioned earlier, look at and challenge your beliefs about yourself. The biggest barrier to self-confidence is the belief, I'm not a confident person or I'm not able to do this. Confront your fears and ask what you are so afraid of. When you break it down, it may be something you can deal with. However, you have to try in order to succeed. Some people are so good at telling themselves about their weaknesses that they have lost the ability to recognize their strengths and successes, however small. Focusing on and highlighting your strengths helps you achieve more personal satisfaction and helps others build their confidence in your abilities. Push yourself a little and make progress in small steps. This will increase your confidence, sometimes very considerably. You need to take small risks to gain huge rewards. For example, offer to organize a social event to test your planning and organization skills. Now take the time to review your notes. Highlight any key points that you need to develop prior to starting the next module.